Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for this opportunity to be gathered together once again. Lord, we do reflect on that truth, that sola scriptura, scripture alone. We know, Lord, that there are many other great resources that can help us learn about you. There are podcasts, videos, devotional books, studies, sermons, But we say scola scriptura because your word stands above all of that. We want to keep your word as primary in our lives. We ask that you would forgive the times when that is not the case. When even though we believe it is scripture above all else and that that should be our number one authority, far too often we put ourselves in that place or we listen to people that are not aligned with your word. We thank you for these simple facts that we have that we sometimes might take for granted. We are literate, Lord. And in human history, the number of people who would be able to read, we are in the minority. And that there are things like printing presses and the internet where we can share information Or where it used to be that one entire province might have a copy of your word in a different language, many of us have five, six, maybe more Bibles in our homes and can access it instantly on the internet. Lord, help us to be grateful for all of the opportunity that we have to grow and to learn and to know more from your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would shape us by it. And as we open it again this morning and we reflect upon why in the world would we be a member of a church, we ask that you would help us to focus on our responsibilities and on our blessings, that we might give praise and thanks to you for all that we are and all that you do through us in community. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Our culture would tell us a number of lies that if we're not careful, we are quick to believe. Specifically around identity. That in our culture, we are regularly told that the most important thing about your identity is that it is the most important thing in your whole life. How you define yourself is equal to your life and that you are the one who determines your totality, your identity. There are lots of questions and conversations and arguments and discussions going on in our culture right now that have to do with identity. People discussing gender, people discussing sexuality, people discussing their political identity. And in those contexts and in those situations, if you buy into the lie that the most important thing in my life is my identity, it is equal to life, and that I am the one who gets to determine it above all else, that if someone disagrees with you about your identity or you try to force someone to do what you want based on your identity, that's where we get fireworks. That's where we get a lot of problems. And I'm not trying to say that we condone people who, this is my identity, and if you don't address me like this, you, right? I I don't want to pick on anyone. That's happening in our culture. But it it is also the case that if we at least understand that this person who's going on a rant, who's feeling attacked, they are doing this because they believe the totality of their life, of who they are, is under attack. They bought into the lie that they are the most important thing, their identity is the most important thing, it is equal to life itself, and they get to define it however they want. And while we can look at a situation where someone loses their cool and they, they blow up over a conversation about gender or about politics, we've all seen that kind of thing, yes? Okay. We've all seen that. If what we can do is we could take a step back 
And again, while not agreeing with what's happening, understand this is sad and it's coming from a place of this is their understanding of identity, that this is the most important thing to them. And that we as Christians, if we are not careful, we can fall into that same kind of trap. That while we might say, I'm a follower of God, in, practic- in practice, in our everyday life, yet we're a follower, but my identity as person who runs this business, right, as a mom, as whatever it might be, that we might place something over and above our identity in Christ. And when that happens, we bring pain to the people around us and, and we hurt ourselves as well. That we are, we are constantly bombarded with those lies and if we are not careful, we buy into them as well. This is not the most pleasant way to end a sermon series, but this is how we started this morning because we as Christians know the truth about our identity and where it comes from. And we don't have to live under the weight of those lies. Can you imagine how exhausting it must be to be 14, 15, 16 years old in today's culture being told your identity is the most important thing and you better figure it out and you have to defend it above all else? That sounds exhausting and it sounds empty. So where does our identity come from? And and we as Christians we gather together because our identity is found in Christ. We're concluding a sermon series here at Providence that we've been calling Why Church? And the basic premise and background of it is this, that more and more people in our country are choosing not to be members of a congregation. That number has gone up above 50%, according to some polls, and that number has been increasing for decades. And so the chance is, again, that if you are 17, 18, 19 years old, over the course of your lifetime, you will become increasingly a minority member of this culture if you remain connected to a congregation. So it is more and more likely that someone, someday, will ask you, well, why are you a member of a church? And you don't have to be 17, 18, 19, thinking about that coming into the future, you might be in a situation right now. You might be 60, looking to retire in the next few years, but you're mentoring the people that are coming after you, and they see the way that you do your job, but they also see the way that you live your life. And they may have questions for you. Well, why do you go to church? In order to be able to answer that well, because we should be able to give an answer for the hope that we have within us, We've taken the last few weeks to think about, well, what are some of the blessings that we get from being members of a church, but also, what are some of the key responsibilities? So we're not just preaching to the choir, hey, are you a member here? And all the members put their hands up, you're good to go. For everybody who's not, this is just for you. No, we all have responsibilities in being a part of a church. And so we've talked about fellowship. We're here to help one another. God has built us to be better together. It's a responsibility and it's a blessing. We've talked about worship. The children just told us, right? Hey, we come and we worship. It's a responsibility that we worship God alone and we get to do it together. We sing, we pray. This is one of the joys of why be a member of a church for worship? Why be a member of a church for stewardship? This understanding that everything that we have financially is a gift from God. It isn't something that we've just earned all by ourselves. And if we understand that it's a gift from God, we're filled with gratitude, and then as we give, we trust in the Lord. And so we give to church, to missions, to those in need, because we know that as Jesus has told us not to store up treasures on earth, but for treasures in heaven. And if you want to gain treasures in heaven, you give away treasures on earth. We talked a little bit about training in God's word, that we come together to read God's word and to study it together, that we're better in community this way, and that it is a responsibility because not every time that you hear a sermon is it the most exciting thing you're going to do all week. Can I get an amen? It was a little bit louder. Stop. Hey. Hey. If you want to play Mozart someday, you start with scales. Amen? 
If you want to live a life that it, you are spiritually mature, you are able to bless children and grandchildren, sometimes we train ourselves, we are dedicated and disciplined in understanding God's word. We can read it in our own language. We've been talking about Reformation Day. That wasn't always the case. There are podcasts. There are videos. There are video devotionals. We have some ourselves here at Providence. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And there are other aspects, right? There are all kinds of ways that you can take upon yourself the responsibility of being trained in your faith, but it's also a blessing, right? The more that we know God's word, the more that we know his love for us, the more that we seek to live in the way that he has called us to. Now, we're also really honest, though. We had a couple of weeks of reflection. While some people may give us an answer, well, why don't you go to church? An answer that's a little bit less than satisfying. We also understand this reality, that there are people who no longer go to church anywhere because they have been hurt by people in the church. You and I have most likely been hurt by people in the church as well. And you and I, if we are in the church, we have probably hurt people too. And so we talked about church hurt, how it's not a fun topic, but that we better own our sin and we better ask God for forgiveness. But we don't just stay there, right? So if someone shares with us, well, this is how I was hurt at my church and this is why I don't go, we don't draw a sword and go attack. Our first response, our first responsibility is to listen and to show empathy. And we're reminded that the blessing is that people don't have to stay wounded. You and I don't have to stay wounded. There's that story from the Gospels where Jesus is being arrested and Peter draws his sword and he attacks and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus' disciples acted in a way that hurt other people, and that still happens. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus healed that man, and the blessing of knowing about church hurt is also recognizing that Jesus can and does still heal wounds. Amen? And we talked that next week, then, coinciding with that about accountability, right? That... that there's great joy in accountability, but none of us really like it, yes? We don't like to hold other people accountable. That's awkward for us. Many of us avoid confrontation at all costs, amen? Some of you didn't say amen because I know some of you. Some of you love it. It's great. It's fine. It takes all kinds. We don't love to be told that we're wrong, and we don't love to tell other people, but the scripture tells us to correct, rebuke, encourage Right? And so some of you have sent me pictures of you going through a car wash the past few weeks. Because the illustration that we used was, just like the guy at the car wash tries to get you to line up your tires, if you have really good friends that love the Lord more than they love you, and they love the best for you more than they want just to be happy with you all the time, then you probably, hopefully, I pray, have a couple of good friends that can do this if you need it. Yes? And that maybe, if you are blessed, there are people that have asked you to do that in their lives. Accountability is not easy. It's not always fun. But our closest, dearest friends and loved ones have that leeway with us, and we are grateful to God for them. Why be a member of a church? Because we need to hold each other accountable. And then last week we did a two-for-one. This great combination of service and, anyone? Sabbath, that we serve one another, but we also need to rest. That these are both blessings and responsibilities that we're reminded of and that they work together. That you are more than your job, right? That you are required to rest occasionally so you don't burn yourself out. That these go together. This balance is important. We hear about that from God. We hear about that from God together as a church. And this morning, one last main reason. Why be a member of a church? And the short answer, the main reason why, is really simple. And it's just this. Jesus. Now, you knew this was coming, yes? I mean, the joke is, right, 
There's a pastor, he's giving a children's message, and he says to the kids, I'm going to describe something, I want you to tell me what it is, and he says, it's about this big, and it's brown, and it's fuzzy, and it has a bushy tail, and it climbs trees, and before wintertime, it gathers a bunch of nuts, and it buries them in the ground. What am I describing? And a little girl puts her hand up, and she says, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but I know the answer is... Jesus, because we're in church. It's the children's message, yes? Hey, why be a member of a church? Jesus. But that's really the main reason, amen? More specifically, it gives answer to our identity. People that are seeking to figure out what their identity is, or they make one aspect of who they are, gender, politics, sexuality, sports team, job they have, career, people who make almost their entire identity about one of those things do so for a few reasons. Because they desire to belong. Because they desire to have meaning. Because they desire to be wanted or needed. They desire purpose. We all have these. Yes? We all want to belong. We all want our lives to have meaning. We all want to be loved by others and to love. We all want to be known. We all desire these things and we try to find them through our identity. But if we build our identity just on what we feel like who we are or one piece of us, it ends up being empty and shallow. It's a weight that is too heavy for us to bear. Now, I've had some unfortunate conversations the past few years with people who are not members of a church anymore. Not just the church where I was a pastor, but they're not anywhere. And them talking about their church hurt, and listening and being empathetic, and coming to this simple conclusion, right, that it is much easier to love Jesus than it is to love his kids. Amen? Now, hey, don't look at anyone around the room, okay? But some of us have experienced this before, yes? I've got a great friend from high school. I've got a friend that I've known from college. I really like them. I love hanging out with them. Their kids... Eh, we're not going camping together for a few years. That kind of a situation. Sometimes it is much easier to love Jesus than it is to love his kids. Because we're sinful and we're broken. And so I'm having this conversation with someone who's talking about how they still love Jesus, but they don't go to church because of his kids. And trying to say to them, I love you, but I feel like you are missing the key component of the gospel and that God saw us in our sin and all of our brokenness and didn't just leave us alone, but came to be with us in the midst of our brokenness, of our crumminess, of the mess. This this message that Jesus, who created all things, stepped into his broken creation to be among the kids that are sometimes hard to love. The kids that would eventually, yes, kill him. That he would die for to save them of their sins. And that Jesus in his ministry did not teach the people that were listening or us today, hey, here's how you follow God. Here's how you live a good spiritual life. What you need to do is, once you get hurt by somebody or there's a community of people that are broken and imperfect, go up to a mountain by yourself and just live there for years. That's how you follow God. He never did that. He taught. He healed. He ministered. He showed compassion and love and grace. And he told us that, yes, while church hurts, it is still worth it that we need one another, we need that fellowship. We circle back to that first sermon that we heard in this series. God has built us to be better together. And so I'm I'm trying to explain this to my friend who has walked away from church, who has that hurt, that recognition that Jesus too was hurt and didn't abandon us, did ministry in us and through us. And we have a, a couple of passages of scripture that drive this message home. And the first one is from the Gospel of John. 
John uses this beautiful and poetic language to describe Jesus. He says this, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, to his own people, to his own nationality, to his own ethnicity, to the people of God. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word, Jesus, became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus did not abandon us in our sin. The gospel message starts with that incarnational story, the one that we're going to celebrate again in just a couple of months. So get your shopping lists ready. Christmas is coming, and we will once again celebrate Advent, the coming of Christ, that he came among us even in our brokenness. And this promise that those who receive him are called children of God. We read this again from a New Testament letter to the Galatian Christians. And so we hear these words. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And Doug, if we could go back just one slide. Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Those were the quickest and easiest ways in that day and age to tell someone what your identity was. Are you Jew or Gentile? Are you male or female? Are you slave or free? Those are the clearest distinguishing marks of who you were. And it's not that those things are unimportant It's just that first and foremost above everything else, you are a child of God, that we are children of God. Because Christ came to earth, because he did not abandon us in our sin and our brokenness, because even though our sins were the reason why he was put on the cross and he was crucified, that even because of those things, through his death and resurrection, We have the promise of eternal life that you can believe in Christ. You can be baptized in his name. You can belong to him and be one of his children. You can be part of the church, of this imperfect, broken, but worthwhile and loving community. This group of believers gathered here in this place, but throughout the world today, In time and throughout space, the saints below and saints above, the church and earth and in heaven. This organization, this body of believers, this bride of Christ, we children of God, we are broken and sinful, yet saved by the grace of God. And our identity, first and foremost, is that it is in Christ Jesus. And when we know this, and we accept it, and we seek to live into it, then the words of 1 John, which is the last scripture we're going to leave, read, rings true in our heart and mind. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Why be a member of a church? for all of these reasons that we have mentioned, but the main reason is this. For Jesus, we are his children. And all God's people said, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Our Lord and Heavenly Father, what great love have you passed on to us that we should be called your children and not just called it, that is what we are. Not because of our works, but because of your grace. Not because of our works, but through faith. Not because of our works, but by Christ alone. Not because we're so smart and have figured it out, but through your word. Not for our own edification alone, not simply so that we can be celebrated, but God, for your glory alone. Heavenly Father, we are your church. We love you and thank you for working in and through community. We ask, Lord, that while it isn't perfect, while we have responsibilities that must be carried out, that we would also recognize the blessings, that we would pass those on to those around us. We thank you, Lord, again, for your message of love and of grace. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.